Hello and welcome to part two of this Respiratory Revision Crash Course Guide. Today we're going to be taking a look at a little bit more of the respiratory system in depth. So in the last video we took a look at the anatomy and embryology of the respiratory system and next time we're going to be focusing on the lung defense, homeostasis and histology. But now we're going to focus on the mechanics of breathing, the reason behind how we respire and also on the lung volumes and lung laws that exist and there are plenty of them to go through. And then last of all, we'll have a look at the alveolar and systemic gas exchange and how that happens. So in terms of breathing mechanics, let's have a think about some basic concepts. Well, the medulla oblongata in our um, brainstem is responsible for the control of our breathing. The phrenic and intercostal nerves stimulate the diaphragm and external intercostal muscles respectively. So the phrenic innervates the diaphragm and the intercostal nerves innervate the external intercostal muscles. And when exercising, we must respire more, of course, as our bodies have a greater demand for oxygen. The muscles are using more oxygen, the muscles are working hard, and therefore we need more oxygen. We need to take more oxygen in through respiration. And respiration really, as we said in the basic principles in part one, is really driven by that pressure volume change in the thorax, which is driven even more so by muscle contraction and relaxation. So by changing the size of our thorax, our thoracic cavity, that's what drives the respiration. The pressure changes are what drives the air in and out of our lungs. So let's have a look at that in a little bit more detail by having a look at inspiration first. Breathing in, essentially. And in order to inspire, we need to draw air in from the environment. And in order to do that, we need to move the air from an area of higher pressure to an area of lower pressure. And in order to do this, we need to generate a lower pressure, therefore, in the thorax from what's in the environment. And to do this, we need to increase the volume. So remember, increasing volume decreases pressure. So if we increase the volume of our thorax, the pressure inside of there is going to decrease. And if the pressure decreases below that, of the environmental pressure, then air is going to move in. And that's exactly what it does. And we increase the volume of our thorax by contracting the diaphragm. So if you imagine the diaphragm is almost a dome shape in relaxation, if it contracts, it flattens. And therefore, that increases the volume of the thoracic cavity. Also, we want our ribcage to move up and out, almost like a pump handle mechanism. And therefore, the external intercostals are going to do this to help uh, increase the volume inside the thorax. So as we said, the diaphragm flattens, ribcage moves up and out. So this is a normal lung with a um, dome-shaped diaphragm. And this, therefore, if we flatten that diaphragm out, the lungs can expand into that space. So now by doing this, you can appreciate the volume inside, the space inside the lungs has increased. And if the volume's increased, the pressure's decreased, and naturally air is going to move in. And it's just one of those things that you kind of need to get your head around, but air's going to move in because the pressure's lower inside the lungs, inside the thorax, than it is in the environment. So if it, what's going to happen on expiration? Well, expiration's a lot more passive. It doesn't essentially need the muscles to uh, relax um, in a active way they kind of naturally do it themselves so if you think about it the diaphragm naturally will relax nothing wants to stay in a contracted state the diaphragm external intercostals they'll all relax naturally and the lung also has something called elastic recoil in other words it pulls itself back in it contracts itself anyway it becomes smaller on occasion expiration can be forced in other words it can be active it doesn't exist as a passive process. But the majority of the time in a normal situation, if you're sat down, if you're working, for example, expiration will be passive and inspiration will be active. So expiration a little bit more depth, air is going to pass out of the lungs and back to the environment because the pressure therefore becomes lower in the environment than the lungs. So as we go from this state to this state, you've got that elastic recoil acting on the lungs to pull, um, pull them back in in terms of their size. And the diaphragm is going to go back to that dome shape and compress the lungs upwards almost. Um, in, in simple terms, you're decreasing the volume there and so you're increasing the pressure. And air is almost pushed back out into the environment. It's a simple way of thinking of uh, respiration. So what's the difference between active and passive? What's the difference essentially you're asking there between inspiration and expiration? Well, inspiration, when it's quiet, in other words, it's active. The diaphragm contracts and the ribs are elevated, as we've just discussed. But you can actually force inspiration as well. And to do this, you need the help of your accessory muscles as well as the diaphragm and the ribs, essentially. So the accessory muscles include your pectoralis major and your scalene muscle. And these contract as well to further increase the volume inside the thoracic cavity. 
In terms of expiration, of course, we've said normally it's quiet, it's passive. You've got that elastic recoil and natural relaxation of the diaphragm and external intercostals. If you want to force expiration, you can bring in the action of the anterior abdominal wall muscles, so things like the rectus abdominis, the transversus abdominis, the internal and external obliques as well, and you can also contract your internal intercostals. Little bit of an introduction to spirometry, not going to cover it in great amount of detail, but essentially it's a way to measure breathing if you translate it from the Latin. It's a simple and safe test, and it gives us a bit of a graph, really, a spirogram, which gives an estimate of lung function. It allows for diagnosis of either obstructive diseases, so asthma, COPD, or restrictive diseases, diseases such as interstitial lung disease. And essentially, it measures the amount of air expelled in a maximum expiration, which is our forced vital capacity, i.e. how much air can you blow out if you really try your hardest. And it also measures the air forcefully expelled in one second, so how much air can you get out in that first second of breathing out forcefully. And then this is expressed as a ratio. And we can interpret these ratios as in if it's below 0.7, it's obstructive, indicative of an obstructive disease, such as COPD and asthma, but this is more second year work. If it's between 0.7 and 0.8, roughly, it's normal. And if it's above 0.8, you're looking at a restrictive lung disease. So next, we can have a look at some lung volumes. And really, you need to put together the definitions for these alongside the graph and understand how they correlate. So, for example, this is the tidal volume. It's a normal breath in and a normal breath out, but we'll have a look at the more in-depth uh, descriptions in a moment. This is the inspiratory reserve volume and the expiratory reserve volume. All of these together is the vital capacity, and a common exam question asks you, well, what is the inspiratory and expiratory reserve volume and the tidal volume all together? It's the vital capacity. Below that, you have the residual volume. This is the amount of air that's left in the lungs, regardless of how much you blow out, essentially. There's always going to be some air left in the lungs, and this is a residual volume. The functional residual capacity, then, or the functional residual volume, is the amount that's left in the lungs after a normal breath out. So residual volumes after an excessively uh, big breath out, as much as you can possibly blow out until you can no longer blow out any more. And the functional residual capacity is what's left after just a normal breath out, what you might be doing now whilst watching this video. All of these together you can call the total lung capacity. How much can your lung hold altogether? Have a look at the definitions of these. As we said, tidal volumes at normal breath. Whilst you're sat here watching this, the normal breath in, the normal breath out. About 500 mil. The expiratory reserve capacity. This is how much you can breathe, uh, breathe out if you really forcefully exhale. And in spiritual reserve capacity, this is how much you can breathe in if you really forcefully inhale. The residual volume, as we said, that's the amount that's left in the lungs at the end of everything. And the functional residual capacity is what's left in the lungs after a normal breath. The vital capacity is the maximum volume that can be both inhaled and exhaled. So if you take the biggest breath in that you can and then blow it all out, that's the, max, uh, that's the vital capacity. And lastly, you have the total lung capacity. This is the entire volume of the lung, and this is roughly 5 litres. Bear in mind that you're roughly breathing in that 500 mil each breath. Next, we've got the diffusion capacity. This measures the ability of the lungs to extract oxygen from inhaled air to the pulmonary capillaries. And it's described by, determined by two factors, essentially. And it's how well the gas diffuses and the haemoglobin level. So we know haemoglobin's got a strong affinity for oxygen and carbon monoxide, and we use carbon monoxide in small doses for this test, um, which means it's not harmful to the patient. So it's the diffusing capacity or transfer factor, depending on whether you use TLCO or DLCO, exactly the same really, um, of the lung for carbon monoxide. In other words, how well does the oxygen pass from the alveoli into the blood? KCO is essentially DLCO, it's exactly the same thing, except it's adjusted for lung volume. So if you've had part of your lung removed, which is more than possible, for example a lobectomy, so a removal of a lobe of the lung, therefore KCO adjusts for this. It means if you've got a patient that's had a previous lobectomy, it adjusts for this um, volume change. I'm going to quickly whiz through the lung laws now, so um, there are lots of them, um, but being able to apply them is what really matters uh, in this case. So Graham's law, this is the rate of diffusion is directly proportional to the solubility coefficient of the gas and inversely proportional to the square root of its molecular one. I thought we'd start with the hardest one. But basically it means carbon dioxide is 22 more times soluble than oxygen and it's much more larger, uh, much larger in size. And this is relevant to the gas exchange of your alveoli. Sit down, try to break it down into bit by bit and figure out what's going on in this law. But really the main clinical application is that carbon dioxide is much more soluble than oxygen 
and it's a larger molecule than oxygen as well. Fick's law, this says, essentially, the amount of gas diffusion in unit time for the resistance of the barrier. This is a long, wordy law. But what it means is the thicker the barrier, the harder it is for something to dissolve through it. Makes sense. So, therefore, the thinner the barrier, the easier it is for something to diffuse through it. Likely, likewise, sorry, the greater the surface area of the barrier, the easier it is. So, two independent factors here, the thickness of the barrier and the surface area of the barrier. And these affect how well something can dissolve or diffuse through it. Moving on, you've got Henry's law, so the solubility of a gas in a liquid is dependent upon the partial pressure of the gas in the air, and the solubility of the coefficient of the gas. So, for example, we try to increase the solubility of CO2 in fizzy drinks, we seal the bottle under high pressure, so pressure affects the solubility of a gas in a liquid. And to avoid the bends, for example, tanks that scuba drivers use um, are filled with air diluted by helium, and we'll explore this a little bit later on in another video. Dalton's law, essentially, this is a total pressure equals a sum of the partial pressures. This couldn't be a more obvious law, really, when you think about it. In other words, if you've got X and Y, two gases in a chamber, it makes Z. So if gas X is 5 and gas Y is Z, it makes 12. It's a fairly simple concept. If you add together all the um, pressures, you get the total pressure. Moving on to alveolar and systemic gas exchange, then. So in terms of definitions you need to know about pulmonary ventilation, this is the volume of air that moves in or out of the lungs per minute. And alveolar ventilation is a little calculation for you. It's tidal volume, so we've experienced this when we were looking at lung volumes, minus the dead space times the breaths per minute. So normal breaths per minute, you're looking probably about 12 to 18 for a patient. Dead space can be classified either anatomically or physiologically. So dead space is essentially any area within the airways that isn't participating in gas exchange. There's no gaseous exchange in dead space. And anatomically speaking, the conducting parts of the airway don't, ex uh, don't exchange gases. So for example, the trachea, no gas exchange there. But this is because of its anatomical position. It's not going to exchange gas. In terms of physiological um, dead space, this is basically the area where you'd normally expect gas exchange to occur, but it's not doing so. For example, an alveoli that's not performing the gas exchange that it should be doing. So arguably a pathological manifestation. But what makes alveoli so special to allow gas exchange to occur? Well, first of all, they have a massive surface area, and there's absolutely tons of them. There's 300 to 600 million alveoli in one person. They have a dense network of capillaries. They're well vascularized, and they have a thin alveolar capillary membrane. It's a small diffusion barrier for the gas to exchange from the alveoli into the um, circulation. Next, we need to think about surfactant, which is secreted from our type 2 pneumocytes. So type 1 pneumocytes form the barrier of the alveoli wall, and the role of the surfactant is secreted by type 2 pneumocytes. It's really important in keeping the alveoli at their normal size and preventing smaller ones from joining to form larger ones, i.e. they increase the lung compliance and they reduce surface tension. They also help to keep our lungs dry, and most importantly, they focus on the Platter's law. In other words, they prevent the alveoli collapsing under the increased pressure during expiration. A simple schematic drawing of air coming in, so an air sac or an alveoli and a capillary. A simple concept that's often forgotten because it's almost so simple. So red blood cells floating around in capillaries, oxygen comes in, and CO2 leaves the waste gas back out, up through the bronchial tree, and up out of the trachea and the nasal cavity. The next thing to be aware of is the ventilation perfusion ratio. So think about these two words. Ventilation essentially means breathing. It's our air that's coming in. And perfusion means the blood. How much blood are we getting into that capillary? And you can have a mismatch in the VQ ratio. So a VQ ratio expresses how well um, gas exchange is really taking place. So if you have a problem here in the air sac, it's a ventilation problem. And if you have a problem here in the capillary, it's a perfusion problem. And you can work out by changes in the VQ ratio, you can work out whether it's a ventilation or perfusion problem based on whether the ratio goes up or down. Lastly, it's, aware to, it's good to be aware of pulmonary ventilation, and essentially this is how well is our air getting from a trachea all the way to our alveoli. And things that determine this is, well, how much resistance is there and how much pressure is there. And Poisson's law essentially summarises this in an equation, but what we're really interested in is, well, how much resistance is there. Things like compressing the radius massively impacts on the resistance, and also resistance can occur because of the parasympathetic nervous system causing bronchoconstriction. It can also be pathological, so think about the lumen in these two airways. It's much wider here and much narrower here, and how would this increase resistance, for example, in this airway, in comparison to this airway, and how would this affect airflow? 
that's everything for this video as always any feedback please do let me know and i'll see you in part three thank you very much